Make sure you wear a mask. Remember how some government officials handled the pandemic? One of the ways you could do it, if you would like to, is put a cloth mask over. The so-called experts and the media made lots of mistakes. Hollywood Beach shutting down. The city is closing the beach and the broadwalk. And experts told us no way COVID leaked from a lab. We've all heard the conspiracy theories at the lab leak. One rare politician who pushed back against the experts was Senator Rand Paul. He claimed our government-funded research might have created COVID. NIH money went to the Wuhan Virology Institute. Now it turns out Rand Paul was right. His new book, Deception, the Great COVID Cover-Up, reveals details about the origins of COVID and the government's deceit. Here's my full interview with Senator Paul. One of the things you point out is that government often made mistakes that made the COVID experience worse. Yeah, I think there's been one set of truths in private and another set of truths for the hoi polloi, you know, for the people who aren't smart enough to make their decisions. And it really is, I think, an example of the elitist approach. You know, those in government who believe government should concentrate power and tell you what to do, they think they're smarter than the rest of us and they think we won't make wise decisions. And so when you see Anthony Fauci in private, when one of his uh, friends in, at work, when some fellow bureaucrat wants to know, do I need to wear a mask? He says, no, the pores are too big. The virus goes right through them. And then in public, he's wearing four masks and goggles and earmuffs, you know, to keep the virus out. Things that have no scientific basis, in fact. But yeah, there's two sets of uh, information going out, one privately and one publicly. Why? They think that there could be hysteria. They're going to calm hysteria down and they're going to calm the public down by platitudes and do this and... They also need to act. They're in government. They need to do something. You know, it's like we must do something. So let's get everybody occupied with wearing masks so it'll look like it's this theater of something they can do. But in the end, the Cochrane analysis looked at 78 randomized studies and found that masks didn't work at all. Now, N95 masks may work. Even the Cochrane analysis looked at the N95 and found they didn't work very well. And there's a couple reasons for this. And I would say this with a caveat. If you're 75 years old and your spouse is sick with COVID the first time around when it was very deadly, I would have suggested, yes, wear gloves and a mask when you go in to take them food, come out, throw them away, and have a brand new pair every time you go in. That's what the doctors and nurses do. It's not foolproof, but it might work to some extent. They do know that the N95 masks, which do have small pores, after you wear them for three or four hours, the moisture of what you exhale, your exhaled air, gets rid of the electro electrostatic charge and they don't filter as well. They really need this electric stack charge. There's a lot of reasons they don't work as well, but they also know that they're so tight that everybody's fidgeting with them. So you and I shake hands, and then I was like, my damn mask is, is pressing on my face, and I do this. So really, I'm just probably bringing things actually to my face. But there's nothing wrong with people trying, but I think what we did was the opposite. So Anthony Fauci wears a Washington Nationals cloth, a piece of cut-up shirt on his face. That's teaching you the wrong thing. So if you are at risk, an elderly person, or an overweight person, and you're taking care of a family member, if you wear a cloth mask in there, you're actually being told the wrong thing to do. You're being told that I'll be safe and you're encouraging bad behavior. So it's the opposite of public health. Anthony Fauci was actually telling people to do things that would put their life at risk. And there's a picture of him wearing a cloth mask? Two, three cloth masks. He showed up in one committee hearing. It's you got not the vaccine and you're wearing two masks. Isn't that theater? No, that's not. Here we go again with the theater. And he got all bent out of shape. But presumably three <laughs> protects more than one. Maybe, but maybe not at all. You know, and the other thing is, is most of the masks don't work if there's air going outside of the mask. So you have to have a perfect seal on your face. And, and a beard isn't so yeah. helpful. And then the question is, and this is the whole problem of public advice, this disease, not for the first time, but probably more so than almost any disease in recent history, had a real difference between ages. What you should tell children is wear nothing, go to school. It's, it's less than getting the chicken pox. It really was. For the elderly, you should say take precautions, maybe avoid crowds, maybe do this. So the advice was different, but they just made everything the same. It's the same with the they vaccine. Said, everybody take yeah. same precautions. But that's government medicine. That's the centralization of control. And this is why I say that Dr. Fauci would be less of a menace if he were a family doctor in Peoria because you could take or leave his advice. But because it became so centralized, and he'll argue, I didn't, I didn't force any mandates. Well, once it becomes the dogma of the CDC and of NIH, what happens is if I own a private hotel, best practices, according to Dr. Fauci, are everybody should wear a mask and we should only have 25% occupancy. So some of the mandates rolled off of best practices, but it all flowed downhill from Fauci and his, uh, I think, mistaken advice. And for saying this, YouTube 
hmm, banned you. I have been censored. I've been kicked out of, you know, a lot of good places, but I take that as a, a badge of honor. And uh, I think the real problem is not so much that YouTube censored me or Twitter or Facebook. Facebook censored people for a year and a half on the COVID origins, but it's that the government's coordinating with them. And that's my real objection to it is that weekly FBI and the Department of Homeland Security are actually meeting with journalists, Twitter, et cetera, and saying, you, you know, this is stuff we want you to take down. You've decided not to go back to YouTube. I'm on Rumble, and I think that's part of sort of the libertarian or free market answer to this. If you don't like somebody, don't use them. If you don't like their policy, don't use them. Go somewhere else. Then you reach fewer people. Maybe, maybe not. YouTube probably is still a lot bigger than Rumble. Um, I don't make any money off of doing it, so I just am happy to go where I can get my views out. And I want to try to uh, put my product or my content where people are actually open to freedom of speech. But I am of the belief that we should stop government from coordinating with these people. I don't think the First Amendment allows government to stop Twitter from banning me or YouTube from banning me. But I think the First Amendment does allow for me to regulate the FBI and say the FBI cannot have routine meetings. And it's amazing how people don't get this. Like, I'll have an interview with a broadcast journalist, and I'll say to them, what would you think if after our interview you had a meeting, the FBI called you and said, we'd like to meet, and then we're going to look at your footage, and we want to see what would be misinformation that you brought out of Rand Paul and that shouldn't be aired? Well, people would be horrified by that. Yet there's little outrage about this. What amazes me is how the outrage is only on one side anymore. I've been trying to get a Democrat on my bill to say that the government shouldn't be involved with censorship, and I cannot find one Democrat. And I lecture them, you know, relentlessly saying, you guys used to be the good guys. In the 1960s, it was the left that criticized Hoover. It was the left that said civil war protesters, you shouldn't be censoring their speech and investigating them. It was the left that says you shouldn't be looking at Martin Luther King's private phone calls and you shouldn't be threatening Martin Luther King. The left was the defender of the First Amendment. The right wasn't so good. Now it's sort of completely flipped. And I'm hard-pressed to find anybody on the left. There are some, but those people are now renegades to the left. Glenn Greenwald, Matt Taibbi. These were people who probably would tell you they came from the left, but are still defenders of the First Amendment. But there's so very few. The silence is deafening. Staying on the topic of mistakes, the beginning of the pandemic, government officials closed beaches. The closed sign staggered on the sidewalk paints a clear picture. The beaches will remain closed. One of my favorite images is in California, the Coast Guard, Coast Guard Cutter, chasing a guy down, paddle boarding by himself in the Pacific Ocean as if he's somehow a threat. And the ridiculousness of that makes people distrust government. My other favorite image is a guy was jogging on the beach in California, and you can tell he's very uh, light-footed and he's just cruising along the beach and a policeman's coming up to try to stop him from being on the beach by himself. And the policeman has these big, heavy boots on. He's trying to get closer. And the guy sees him out of the corner of his eye and just sort of picks up his pace. And you can just see this guy running and he never gets caught. And you're like, hooray for freedom. A guy's on the beach running, leave him the hell alone. Vaccine mandates. They were trying to protect people. Good intentions don't excuse bad behavior. It goes back to the, the supposition, are people too stupid to make their own mind up? And I like to go back to the sort of the beginning with vaccines to smallpox. When smallpox came out, the vaccine was like 1720s. It was very, very controversial, and it was a live vaccine. They took some pus from somebody who had smallpox, unroofed it, and stuck it in somebody's arm who didn't have smallpox. They gave you smallpox. And yet the public, by and large, pretty much accepted it. It had a death rate of 1 in 50, but the death rate from smallpox was 30%. People aren't stupid. When smallpox came to town, people lined up and took this vaccine. The doctors who started doing it vaccinated their kids first. They didn't mandate it. They showed, look, I'm proud of this and I'm vaccinating my kids. And it, it took off. Uh, George Washington eventually uh, tells Martha she can't come to the camps until she's had a smallpox vaccine, and she does. But here's the interesting point about it, and we put this in the book as well. George Washington didn't take the vaccination. You're like, why? Was he a vaccine uh, anti-vaxxer? Why didn't he take the vaccine? Because he had smallpox scars on his face. He'd had smallpox. So we used to believe and know that when you had something, it provided immunity. Not always perfect immunity. Smallpox is pretty much complete immunity. But most time people knew if you had something, if you got it again, you'd have less of a reaction the second time around because your body already knew it. doesn't provide perfect immunity either. Probably actually less so. We now, through a million person study, know that getting it naturally was twice as good. But if you tell this to a left wing reporter, they'll say, oh, you just want people to get sick and die. And if they don't die, they have immunity. It's like, well, no, I'm just acknowledging that a lot of people got sick. Some did die. It was tragic. 
But the ones who got sick, give them the information so they know what to do. Do they need 10 more vaccines or is it protective? See, the CDC knows this. The CDC will not reveal this information. So instead of your government helping you make decisions, the CDC will not tell us. If you're 60, let's say you're 75 years old and you've had two vaccines, you took the advice in the beginning, and then you've had COVID once, what are your chances of dying again? I think they may be zero or very close to zero. May not need your third, fourth, and fifth one, but you should be given the information. The government has this information. What does it mean to have been infected? They just sort of left that out. Why won't the CDC give this information out? This is where you get into whether or not you believe there's something nefarious and a monetary incentive involved and uh, whether or not they're doing this to make money for big pharma. I'm not so crass as to believe they. I think these probably are good people that aren't doing it for it. But I've asked questions. So I've asked, is anybody on the committees to approve the vaccine? Do any of them receive monies from the vaccine manufacturers? They won't answer me. Dr. Fauci told me it was none of my business. He said that a law prevented him from revealing that to me. And that's not an acceptable response. When they approved the third vaccine for children, the first committee was the FDA committee. It's full of all scientists that are pro-vaccine. In fact, they don't have a problem with mandates at all. They came out with the advice 65 and older, nobody else for the booster. CDC had another vaccine committee, scientists, all pro-vaccine, fine with mandates. They said the same thing, 65 and older. Rochelle Walensky, a political appointee of Biden, overrode both scientific committees and said the vaccine booster should be given to six months and up. Most of the countries of Europe don't do this. Almost every country of Europe, it's 12 and over, and it's advice. Why? What's the motivation? That's the question. Get more Build- people frightened, and then they'll take the vaccine, and that will save America? I think most of them are not very smart, and they just blindly think, take the damn vaccine, shut up and take it, it's good for you, don't think about it. And maybe on the margins doesn't do much for kids, but probably not going to hurt you. The problem with the vaccine turns out that there is some risk of a heart inflammation for young people. We've advised people to take it. If you're older, take the vaccine, even take the booster. It's probably not going to hurt you. Have you? God gave me my vaccine. I was naturally inoculated, but members of my family, my wife got vaccinated. We're not against the advice. Naturally inoculated, meaning you had COVID. I had COVID, so I have immunity. and Some immunity. Yeah, well, I haven't gotten it again that I know of. I've had a cold once, and that could have been COVID. I don't know. It should be a personal decision. W- weren't there people that so- used to say, your body, your choice? My body, my choice! My body, my choice! My body, my choice! My body, my choice. My body, my choice. Except for vaccines, I guess, you know. In Sweden, where they did say natural immunity was helpful, they were trash. And it turns out they did as well or better than most parts of better. Europe. And they also didn't mandate masks in schools. They also didn't close the schools. So everything we did in this country is wrong. And that's why the debates, it's, this isn't just looking back in the rearview mirror just for the hell of it. This is to make sure we actually learn something and don't do this kind of lockdown uh, mentality again. For more of my content, go to johnstossel.com. I post a new short video every Tuesday. That's it johnstossel.com. On balance, the vaccines were a good thing. If you were at risk, yeah. So I, I would say that you, you it base it on risk. If you say, are they a good thing for a 75-year-old? I think we saved lives. If you say, did they save any five-year-old's life? No. And we know now that it's about two to three kids out of 15,000 will get a heart inflammation, which may lead to permanent damage to their heart. So People just need to know that. If you're a parent want to take that risk for your 15-year-old who's perfectly healthy, fine. But there are a lot of parents with a healthy 15-year-old, if you're told that the mortality is zero, that uh, will take their chances with COVID rather than two or three chances out of 15,000 of a heart inflammation. Since it works for older people, people my age, right. the Republican messaging may have killed people. There's data that shows that more Republicans died. I think it's actually the opposite. I think what happened is vaccine hesitancy comes from people's disbelief in government. So if the government comes to you and says, everybody needs to take a vaccine, including your six-month-old, and you know either instinctively or through the evidence that they're lying to you about the six-month-old, that they really don't need it, then you start to distrust them. You say, I'm 75, but if they're lying to me about the kids, maybe they're lying to me about this. So I would say that some vaccine hesitancy came from people's distrust, just overwhelming distrust of government, period. But I think government made it worse and made vaccine hesitancy worse by telling you things that weren't true. Everybody in the news knew this was a disease of the elderly. Here's a fact. For the most part, vaccines were voluntary, except for people who worked in the government, firemen, policemen, things like that, hospital workers. But for the vast majority of the public over 65, you could make your choice. Over age 65, over 97% of people chose to be vaccinated. 
So this whole idea, you know, Anthony Fauci will interview with the New York Times and they'll be living, oh, if we didn't have such vaccine hesitancy, oh, millions of people died. People at risk are not stupid. People read the newspaper. They saw this on the news. And no matter what they kept telling us about young people getting sick, that was extraordinary. This was a disease almost entirely of the elderly. The elderly got it and they all got vaccinated. Now, if you want to look at 30-year-olds, how many of them got vaccinated? It's like 20 or 30 percent. Well, guess what? Very few 30-year-olds died. And most of that was associated with obesity, and they should have promoted that. Instead, they said it had racial origins and this and that. No, overweight people were significantly at risk. And I know several people who died in their 30s and 40s or who got very sick. And obesity was a huge factor in this disease. One other Republican policy to ask you about. Governor DeSantis in Florida, I think, did a great job. He kept the state open. Kids in school did better than other states. But he also, in his venom against vaccine mandates and mask mandates, said, you're not allowed in your store to require customers yeah. to have a mask. No, that's wrong. And I think he went too far. He did the same thing with the commercial um, cruisers, you know, the, the cruise lines. He said to them, oh, you can't have a vaccine mandate. It, it mistakes. And this is a, a real problem between public and private. Uh, libertarians believe that the government shouldn't force you to do things, but we have no problem with a private entity. So if you have a restaurant and you are all in on the mask and all in on the vaccines, nothing should ever stop you. You can demand 10 vaccines and 10, and 10 masks if you want. The only other problem on the side of, well, is this government or not, is that the government best practices sort of push some of this down. So when Fauci says it and the CDC makes it their official plan, and you have a private restaurant and you want to do no masks and no vaccines, you're worried about being sued then. So there is this pressure from government, but I don't think the answer is to then regulate you as a private business and say you can't do it. The answer is to tell people at the top, you need to quit putting out these pronouncements that are not scientific and are not certain because you're making a liability problem for businesses who feel like you know they don't want to follow your mandates, but they've eventually become mandates, these edicts. I used to think that the public would learn from these government mistakes and say, maybe I'm not going to be so trusting next time. But I don't think they will. I don't know. I, I think you'd be surprised. I think people have learned from this. And I think people learned um, what to trust and what not to trust and, and to be skeptical. So I think people will be smarter the next time around. And my hope is that people are smart enough not to do the lockdowns. And if you look at the lockdowns, pretty much some people got it. And unfortunately, it is somewhat partisan. Republican states had less severe lockdowns and more quickly got out of it, and the Democrat states didn't. I think it was Rasmussen did a poll of people, and it's amazing. If you poll people who identify as Democrats, um, a good half of them believe maybe you should put people in jail for not being vaccinated or they should be forcibly kept in their homes. So the authoritarianism, or what I call the impulse to authoritarianism, is strong, but it seems to be divided between the parties. The sad thing is the left used to be good about civil liberties. They used to be good about you know, free spirit, free ideas, not having things uh, be censored and unified by some kind of government authority. But we've really gotten away from that. Republicans are authoritarians about other things. I'm not saying either party is perfect. Uh, in fact, sometimes a pox on both parties may be the best answer. But on the COVID, I think it, it has been that the Republicans have tended to be more right than wrong, and the Democrats have tended to be more restrictive on personal behavior. The big point in deception. I believe that when they everybody was saying, came from animals, from bats. Bats, bats gathered in China for food. I'm probably 90% confident that the new coronavirus came from bats. I initially was there too, throughout probably a lot of 2020. I did not spend a lot of time thinking about the origin because I knew the first SARS virus, which came out in 2003, 2004, came from animals, came from civets. When they tested the handlers of the civets, they found an increased number of them had antibodies. So they'd been having infections. MERS was another SARS virus. It came out and they found it in camels and they found a source. Each time they found the source, though, within a few months. So after a few months in 2020, they didn't find an animal source. Then there became reports of 80,000 animals being tested, no animals with it. Tested by China, all over China, because they were looking for an animal source. Right. And you have to realize that the Chinese, while they may not always be honest and they may not always be forthright, they had an incentive to try to find it if it was in animals, because now the theory is that it came from a lab. So now it's sort of government sponsored, accidental, likely, but more related to the government. So if you're the Chinese government, you're looking for blame. Everybody knows it started in Wuhan. You'd really want it to come from the wet market. 
But pretty much within three or four months, the CDC in China uh, said it didn't. They were pretty certain it did not come from the wet market. Though some other experts say we're not sure. We, it may have come from animals. There's not a smoking gun that we can say with 100 percent certainty. There's a lot of evidence on, on both sides of the ledger. But uh, the lack of an animal uh, host, the lack of antibodies in animal handlers, the lack of uh, diversity in the genetics of this. When an animal virus comes to humans, it's not very infectious initially. So if it's in civets, it's very infectious in civets because it's been circulating in this animal for a while. When it infects a human, it's more prone to be in the civet, so it's, un, it's, it's not very good at, at infecting other humans. So it does it again and again until it gets lucky. When it gets lucky, it gets in someone's body and it mutates and then becomes infectious to other humans. So what you find is diversity. You find all these leaps from animals to human, and so your original genetic diversity will be like 20 or 30 different genetic sequences of viruses. What did we find with COVID? The original strain, it's single source. It's one genetic variety, wasn't mutating. And when you have a single genetic, homogenous genetic code for a virus, it looks like it came from one source. It looks like it came from the lab. So evil Chinese scientists in a lab funded by America? America funded it. And I think it was uh, maybe not done with evil intentions. It was done with misguided notion that gain-of-function research was safe. And so many people and explain gain of function research. Gain of function is when you take a virus that exists in nature and another virus in nature, and you take part of one virus and stick it onto the other. So one of the things that they can do with coronavirus is they take an S protein, they stick it on another virus, but then they say, well, then let's see what it does to humans. Well, the thing is, is they sometimes create viruses that don't exist in nature that are now more infectious. They've gained the function of lethality or infectiousness by com being combined in a lab. We know they were doing this, and this is one of the things that we discover in the book, and one of the things that we put out there. Fauci admits on February 1st of 2020, at the very beginning, that they're doing gain-of-function research in the Wuhan labs and that we funded it. And the purpose of it is to let the virus thrive and then f develop a vaccine, find a way to kill it. Probably. Just probably. Well, well the theory is, is they were working on something like that. They were working on a vaccine uh, what they call a pan-corona vaccine for all different types of coronaviruses, which is what COVID is. They were working on this vaccine and that it must have leaked out. Other information that supports this is we know that three people in the Wuhan lab run by Dr. Xi, three of her co-workers got sick with a virus of unknown origin in November of 2019. They never revealed this, but it's been found out through some intelligence means. We do know now that the virus actually started and the first cases, patient zero, basically is in her lab. And that was more than a thousand kilometers away from where bats live. Exactly. It's six, eight hours by car south where you find the bats. But this gets back to the question of evil versus just bad sense or bad judgment. If viruses exist, let's say they exist 300 feet below the level in guano in a cave, the likelihood that that virus 300 feet under the ground in a remote area of China is going to interact with a lot of people and cause a pandemic virtually zero. But what if we send virus hunters 300 feet down into the cave, they extract the virus, bring it back to a metropolitan area of 15 million people. There's a chance that somewhere in that transmission, the virus leaks out that never would have encountered man, but it's worse. They take this unknown virus, they bring it back to Wuhan, 15 million people. Then they say, yeah, this is a new virus, a new coronavirus. What would happen if we mixed it with this other coronavirus? So the whole virus identification project, which has been going on for about 10 years or more, hundreds of millions of dollars have gone into this U.S. dollars, has been not just to identify every virus on the planet, but to identify it and then do gain-of-function research to manipulate it to see what happens. And there are legitimate scientists. There's Kevin Esvelt, who we quote in the book uh, from MIT, who says that basically this is a risk to civilization because we could wind up with a virus that's 50 percent lethal, that leaks out of a lab and kills half of the planet. That literally is a possibility. But they're not just playing around. They're trying to find ways to stop right. diseases. But many scientists have now looked at this and said that we haven't found it. We've been doing this gain-of-function research for quite a while, and nobody can really point towards an exact benefit from this. The other argument against this is that when you create viruses in the lab, evolution is random. And so when a virus or a dangerous virus evolves, it does it through random mutation, and then something, we get an unlucky one, and it takes off. 
if you created a, vir uh, a virus in the lab, it's not random, it's man-made, and you say, oh, I'm doing this so I can discover what's going to come from nature. Well, because it's random and there are millions of different combinations that could happen, the likelihood that you create something that creates a vaccine that's going to help anybody is pretty slim to none. This controversy has been going on since before COVID. It really started in 2010 with the avian flu. The avian flu is from chickens and birds, and it's a very deadly when it gets into humans, 50% mortality, but it's not very contagious. So a guy in the Netherlands said, why don't we see if we can aerosolize it, make it uh, transmitted by air, even though it's not normally transmitted that way. And people said, that's crazy. And he did it. And then there was a discussion over whether the, the knowledge should be published because it might become a roadmap for terrorists to create this kind of virus. And so Anthony Fauci was on one side and Richard Ebright and the other scientists were on the other side and they had a big war. And Anthony Fauci won, like he's won so many times. And he said in 2012, even if a pandemic occurs, if a scientist becomes infected and the community becomes infected, the knowledge is worth it. Well, that's a judgment call. And I would say there's probably 16 million families around the world who might disagree with that now. But this is a real debate that has to be had. It's all funded by government. Whether or not government should have some regulations on what they fund, I think without question, we should regulate government more um, to have more scrutiny over this. They are still funding gain-of-function research. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's 12 different places in the United States that we do this. There are sending, some labs that we're not even allowed to go into that we're petitioning to try to find out about this. But there's one other important thing that happened in this, and, and it adds to the culpability. It wasn't just a bad decision of Anthony Fauci. There was a pause between 2014 and 16. This was so dangerous. They said no more gain-of-function research. And yet it kept happening. How did they get these they exemptions? Said, who the, our government. Our government stopped the funding of gain-of-function research from 2014 to 16. And yet many of these things in Wuhan were still going on through this. Who approved them? Well, they also set up a committee. In 2017, they turned the spigot back on. It's in January of 2017. Gain-of-function is now going to be uh, funded once again. But as they turn it on, it's like they set up a committee. And this committee is supposed to see all dangerous research and say, is it dangerous? Should we let it happen? None of the Wuhan research went before there. So when I questioned Fauci and committee, he says, all my people, up and down, all 12 dozens of experts tell me it's not gain of function. It's like, where's the discussion? Have you ever heard of a government discussion where there's no paperwork? And why didn't it go before the committee? And then I met the person who's in charge of the safety committee. He said he only looked at three studies over like a four-year period. And I said, why? He says, I didn't have the ability to go out and look at studies. I had all, it had to be self-referred. People had to volunteer. I think I'm doing gain of function research. Would you look at it? And he looked at three, and I think they turned down one or two out of three. But this was exempted from the safety committee. It could have only been done with Anthony Fauci's permission. I think we are eventually going to find paperwork. We haven't got it yet. We're going to find paperwork that shows that Anthony Fauci gave permission for the research to happen in Wuhan without scrutiny by the safety committee. The media is weirdly uncurious about this. It's perplexing. Democrats in Congress and their allies in the media are always curious about things killing people, you know, dangers, safety. So I've been to at least a dozen hearings on whether a chemical in plastic causes cancer, which I think probably isn't true. But the Democrats are gaga over, it's like, uh, I can't remember the, the name of the chemical now, but it's like in baby bottles, it's in milk, it's in all this plastic, and they think it causes cancer. But it may or may not, and I'm not against studying whether it does, but at the same time, they're curious about this, now we have a disease that killed maybe 16 million people worldwide, about a million people in America, and they're not curious as to how we got it and whether it could happen again. Um, but that is one of my goals, is to create legislation that uh, more strictly uh, regulates gain-of-function research being funded by our government. This company, EcoHealth Alliance, most Americans haven't heard of it. They were able to uh, accumulate maybe over $100 million in U.S. taxpayer dollars, and a lot of it was funneled to Wuhan. Interestingly, in 2020, when the virus comes out and the pandemic starting to spread, within a month or two, there's a letter to Lancet. And in the letter, they say that anybody that's saying that this was a could have come from the lab as a conspiracy theorist and not to be trusted, and 20 people signed it. But it was led by a guy named Peter Dazak, who ran EcoHealth. He never admitted that he had a conflict of interest. Eventually, Lancet caught him and there was an apology made. But from the very beginning, and I've never heard of before this, scientists talking about a conspiracy theory. And it turns out that probably the scientific community is either 50-50 towards the lab leak now or more. And initially, though, they squelched all dissent and said, you're a conspiracy theorist if you're saying this. But they didn't reveal that they had a monetary self-incentive to cover this up. 
And how does it happen that people in the U.S. government are so comfortable having Chinese researchers who are working for the Chinese government, which they're terrified of, right. just throwing this money at them? Well, you know, Anthony Fauci said that he is the science. But they're really criticizing science because I represent science. I think he is the defender of the funding of science, the business of science. There's billions of dollars. These are not just people that are, you know, cloistered up in some kind of monastery wanting to try to find the cure for cancer. These are people with uh, receiving uh, billions of dollars, millions of dollars. So I think that there is a self-interest there that was never revealed. And I think that that's part of the problem. You said Peter Daszak was running Eco Health, but he's still running it, being paid half a million dollars. Yeah, the NIH and he won't is, talk to people about. Yeah, this. he won't reveal his notes. So the Lancet Commission, when they felt that he had taken advantage of them, they started a commission, the Lancet Commission, to look into this. And Jeffrey Sachs was in charge of this. He initially had Peter Dayzak on the committee until he discovered how dishonest he was being with things. But Peter Dayzak has refused to reveal his notes. Ultimately, there is a great deal of culpability on his part. And to give you an example of who he is and how the money changes hand, people are like, oh, I'm going to cure the world from cancer or this disease. No, this is a guy who has $15,000 cocktail parties at the Cosmo Club in D.C., invites Anthony Fauci and others there for cocktails. This is a guy who's been schmoozing. You know how some people schmooze politicians? There are whole organizations now set up to schmooze bureaucrats. And part of the problem that made it worse, Anthony Fauci was there for 40 years. Anthony Fauci became the J. Edgar Hoover of the NIH. Too much power, too much longevity. And it was also greatly expanded after 9-11 because they got involved with bioweapons and a huge amount of defense money started flowing in. So Anthony Fauci used to be 127th of the NIH. He became so big and so powerful that he became more powerful than the head of all of NIH. But billions of dollars flowed through him. And we're still scratching the surface as far as trying to determine um, the classified stuff that's going on. We're having trouble getting the unclassified information, but uh, I think there's a great deal more if we can ever get into the classified uh, projects that they're doing. Well, you eventually won. The media trashed you all the way through. Rand Paul, stop it. You look like an idiot. But some now have changed. Vanity Fair's headline. Anthony Fauci once again forced to call Rand Paul a sniveling moron. <laughs> Two months later, the headline is, major shift, NIH admits funding risky research in Wuhan. Paul might have been on to something. Yeah, I think that uh, ultimately they're going to have to admit to this. But to me, it's not so much about them admitting or apologizing or their culpability. It's really about trying to prevent this from happening again in the future. I mean, the big goal for me is some sort of bipartisan legislation that will prevent this from happening again. Did you write this book by yourself? Well, I had some help from my wife. And so what I usually say is that it was a big, huge, maybe not that interesting book. And then my wife, Kelly, got a hold of it and added a lot of interesting uh, color to the book. 971 footnotes, given all the stupid stuff you have to do as a politician. Yeah, and I, I can't believe you have the time to read 900 sources. I got really intrigued by this when I saw the very first conversations on January 31st of Anthony Fauci. He sends emails back and forth till three in the morning. He's obviously petrified that it's going to come out that he funded this lab. And so those emails intrigued me because we see all the way through till three in the morning, the last email at three in the morning is to a guy named Bob Cadillac. I didn't know who that was at first, but I discovered in doing the research for this book that Bob Cadillac, who receives an email at three in the morning, he's head of the safety committee that's supposed to oversee this research. So why is Anthony Fauci emailing him at three in the morning saying, nothing to see here probably came from animals because he knows that, and that Bob Cadillac's committee should have reviewed this. And the only reason they didn't is because Anthony Fauci prevented this research from getting the, the proper safety review. Thank you, Senator Paul. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. New episodes drop the first and third Mondays of every month. You can subscribe everywhere you get podcasts.